So, I'm Robert Mustafi. I'm an engineer at Joint. Before Joint, I was at Sun Microsystems on their Fishworks team. And at Joint, I worked on the Illumos operating system and our work there. I've also done some of what we call cloud analytics, which is basically a way to go and use DTrace to go and understand hundreds of machines. And then I also did work on the KVM port, which we'll get to in detail. So, what is SmartOS? So, you know, it's kind of a weird sounding name, you know, a little markety, you know, but. So the first part is that it actually has a pretty rich, rich we're descended from Solaris. So we get a lot of features and benefits from that. So for example, we have Zones, which is a way of doing OS level virtualization. We have Crossbow, which is a facility for basically doing virtual networking, basically adds Phoenix, and lets you kind of do a lot of flow control and work on a per NIC basis. We have ZFS, which and most people have heard of in a little bit. Um, there you get the notions of pooled storage, which is pretty important, and data integrity. And we also have T-Trace, which is basically a way of doing dynamic tracing guaranteed to be safe for production. So we took these ideas and we combined it with some of the stuff that we're actually doing and using at Joint. So basically kind of giving this more of a hypervisor focus. So the things there is that you want the core OS to be pretty small, and it's basically only, traditionally only going to be booted via Pixie. So we do Pixie boot, but you also can do uh, USB, a CD-ROM ISO, pretty much whatever other mechanism you like booting over, that would work. Um, we also make it a goal to really focus on making sure that what's on the actual machine itself is mostly all user data. There's a little bit of additional configuration just kind of for convenience, but primarily the idea is that you're going to be creating containers, you're going to be creating virtual machines, and those are going to have the majority of the configuration and packages and things that you need. Then we've also added a lot of tools to kind of facilitate and basically make this a lot easier to do. So we've written up kind of tools from scratch which basically take a lot of these features, combine them, so creating a new VM or kind of creating one of these instances is straightforward. Probably the last piece of this is that we ported KVM. So is, are people here familiar with KVM? Anyone here not? So KVM is a facility for on Linux initially for called the kernel virtual machine. So it basically uses uh, Kimu, which was an emulator, and then combines that with the using Intel and AMD hardware to basically create a fully hardware virtualized uh, hardware virtualization, which is similar to something like VMware. So just kind of some other facts is that uh, SmartOS is an open source distribution of Illumos. So just as you have distributions of the Linux kernel, say take Debian, Arch, you know, Red Hat, you know, whatever your favorite distribution is, there are multiple distributions of Illumos, you have Open Indiana, and several others. So, and for those who aren't familiar with Illumos, um, there was once Open Solaris. Oracle has kind of basically just killed Open Solaris and you know left everyone who once cared about it kind of just high and dry. So the community bond together, mostly due to initial work by Garrett Diamore here, and uh, we went and we've basically gone through. We've replaced a bunch of the kind of proprietary closed bits. We're working on getting rid of the rest. We've actually gone and added a lot more new stuff, so stuff that you're actually not going to see in, say, Oracle Solaris 11, and stuff that you actually can't see unless people want to play by the rules of the licenses that they created. So what is a zone? So a zone is basically a self-managed container. The whole idea is that you should be able to configure your own users, kind of configure your storage, your networking, all the different services you want to run. It should basically feel like a standalone operating system. So the different containers don't know about each other, basically you basically get the traditional system administration view that everyone is used to. That's kind of the same idea you have with the virtual machine. And so the idea is that important things with these are you have isolation. So zones can't actually see each other. So the global zone can see about the existence of all the other zones that are there, but any other zone, so anything that you actually want to create, doesn't know that these other pieces exist. So there's a lot of things that we do to help this. So for example, there's a the notion of exclusive networking stacks. So what happens here is that you can actually go and create this notion of a networking stack. So basically, when everything that basically goes down through this virtual, virtual net, through the networking in the guest, goes through its own stack, has its own TCP stack, has its own IP stack, will have its own, basically goes straight to the actual underlying devices. So, the benefit here is that you can actually now plot. You basically will never actually see traffic from other zones. So even if you want to snoop these devices promiscuously, you actually can't see them. 
can't see traffic going to someone else. And then the other nice thing is that you can then create your own firewall rules and you know, have your own servers that are, you know, own services up and running. So every zone can have, you know, say an Apache service listening and no one really is, no one will really conflict. And then there's also file system isolation from this. So through ZFS, and we'll get into a little bit more about how that works, you can basically ensure that everyone has their own piece of the file system. And so unlike a Chirrut, where if you have a traditional Chirrut kind of jail style thing, you can actually kind of escape out of a Chirrut and get to the, the whole rest of the file system. Whereas in this case with the zone, you actually don't have those other parts of the file system ever mounted in there. So basically there is no Chirrut to escape out of. So with, with most container systems, you get your standard bevy of resource controls. If you want to control how much memory, what basically, how much disk I.O. you're getting, how much network I.O., you get that. You want to control how much swap, how much memory the guests can lock down, kind of all those things, you know, you have plenty of those. One of the other interesting things is you can actually control CPU on two different facets. So you can basically say when the CPU is 100% busy, each zone is entitled to this percent of the CPU. So you want to basically say, once I hit full CPU saturation, everyone gets this share. So basically you're getting kind of guaranteed to get some amount there. But then the other piece that you want to do is say, I actually want to make sure that I guess a different zone can't use too much of the CPU. So say you're on you know, modern systems, you have a bunch of quad, you have like say two quad core processors, each have hyper threading, so you have to 16 to 32 logical CPUs. You can actually then say, I'm going to limit the number of CPUs, the amount of CPU you can ever use. So even if the system's idle, I can ensure that you never use more than 100, you know, one CPU or one and a half CPUs. So it's a pretty granular thing. Along with this, you can assign to zones different sets of privileges. So if you wanted to, you could actually give a zone the ability not to fork or process. You could make it so you can't actually own files, chmod files. I mean, some of these don't necessarily make sense for most traditional contexts, but the idea is that there's a rich set of privileges that exist in the system. So the act of giving someone root historically is all or nothing. And most people kind of agree that that's not a good model. So you don't want to have a full root access to Apache just so it can open up on port 80. And sure, it'll drop privileges, but if there's something that goes wrong during that interim period, well, someone now has full root access, and that's bad. So the whole goal is that you can merit out these and assign specific privileges and even devices to these zones. That way, you actually can't give access to certain devices into these zones. To help kind of make all of this easier, kind of make this work, they create the notion of brands. So a brand does more than just configuration. Um, so it also controls how you actually can go into the system and actually integrate actually at the system call layer. So part of this is how we, someone can take Solaris 10, Solaris 9, Solaris 8, and actually run those branded zones, which actually expect a slightly different system call interface, and actually run them in a traditional zone. In fact, this was even used to go so far as basically do work to make the equivalent of a Linux branded zone, where someone actually went and implemented what the Linux expected system call interface was, and you could actually run a native Linux binary. And then that has since been kind of discontinued, right, where just because there's a, it's a very large moving target, people have been kind of more opting just to use the full virtual machine experience instead. So just to kind of further explain OS virtualization, basically the idea is that unlike hardware virtualization, where you have the full current, you have the, all the hardware to emulate, you have to actually now emulate all of these hardware timers, you have to basically emulate the actual disk, emulate the actual networking. With OS virtualization, you actually don't need to do that. So all you do is you, you share the same actual kernel. So basically, the notion of these containers is built in to the operating system as a first class citizen. This means that basically you are going to share the same kernel. So, and that because of this, agents that are in the, the global zone, which is kind of the the traditional administrative environment can actually then go see into the other. So for example, if you want to use dtrace to understand what's the performance, the global zone can actually go and see performance across all of them. And then you can debit uh, privileges such that each local zone can understand what's going on in their environment. So one of the next things we talked about is uh, Crossbow. So Crossbow is a project that integrated at the end of 2008 and it basically had created the notion of virtual networking interfaces and virtual switches inside the operating system. 
So here you can create a, one of these virtual NICs to either, you can basically send it over all the traffic over a physical NIC or to another virtual s switch. As a part of this, we have a lot of support for anti-spoof set up on the actual devices. So you can basically plumb up this virtual NIC, say, here's a MAC address, here's some set of IP addresses, and if you see any traffic coming out of here that doesn't match one of those IP addresses or one of those MAC addresses, stop it right there. So basically, it'll never get out. So basically, you don't have to go in and kind of do extra configuration to get these things. It kind of just is coming by default. So if you basically have a bunch of guests that exist, you want to make sure that someone doesn't go off and start basically pretending to be someone else. I mean, you have the classic example of people who are basically going to spoof their MAC address, try and spoof their IP address to kind of cause harm. And so this stops us before it actually gets out. So it will never actually go out on the wire. In addition to all this, you get your standard set of bandwidth controls. So you can basically limit things on a per VNIC basis. You can set maximum bit rates, minimum bit rates, kind of guarantees of QS. And creating these is actually pretty straightforward. Basically, you just have to specify what physical device you want to put it over and just give it a name. And that's it. So has everyone here has anyone here not heard of ZFS? Okay, cool. That's good. So ZFS is a copy on write file system. So what that means is that you're never gonna actually, whenever you're gonna modify some piece of the file system, you're gonna make a copy of that data, then modify it and write it. And then you're gonna go kind of up the entire file system and make swaps. So basically, you're gonna go modify a certain block, then you're gonna go make a single swap in an inode, make a single swap, and just kind of keep doing that up until you get to the root of the file system. The reason that this is important is that it makes sure that if you crash in the middle of operation, so say you have a power outage or there's a system panic, that the on-disk format, the on-disk is always in a sane state. So you can always go through and you can actually under read all your data and recover it. So the worst case is that you lost that one second of write that you were doing when the power went out, but you actually have all your on-disk state as still valid. So you don't have to worry about the fact that you didn't just lose all of your data. You don't have to go run a FISC, which is going to go take hours to go run. Now, in another part of this that's kind of really almost the more interesting part of ZFS is the fact that it does pooled storage. So I've, many of us have gone, we're setting up a new laptop or a desktop. We have our hard drive. We get to the point in the installation where we're asked to partition our disk. Then we have to kind of start playing games. Am I going to use one partition for everything? Am I going to put my home directory on a separate partition? Am I going to put var on another partition? OK. If I do that, what sizes am I going to put everything on? OK, hopefully I guess correctly, because when I, one of them fills up you know, at the wrong time, you know, now I've got to somehow try and resize the physical disk and resize those file systems. Hopefully I can shrink my file system. Hopefully I can grow it. Hopefully you no, know, that does, has, causes problems for my data. So with the idea with pooled storage is that you've actually separated out the question of how you're going to divvy up and do quotas on your data from the actual layout of it on disk. So here you could create these notions of data sets, basically these different part portions of the file system, basically creating a namespace in the file system. You can mount these at different points. So you could create a, one file, one of these data sets for your, all the home directories. You create another one for the root partition. And the idea here is that you can set quotas and reservations on these, and they can be changed on the fly. So you might say by default, I'm going to set a quota of 20 gigs on my root partition and just kind of let the rest of my home directory just take everything else. And then when you realize you hit that 20 gigs, you can then go back and evaluate, OK, do I want to just increase the quota? OK, good. I can just change that to 30. Everyone's happy. Whereas opposed to the other kind of the past world, you have to go through. And unfortunately, you hit the case where it's like, OK, can I resize this file system? Can I shrink it down? Can I grow it? Or do I have to just actually, is it easier for me just to wipe the disk and start over and restore from backup? And those are not fun places to be. So one of the other parts is that ZFS actually integrates in the volume manager. So in the past, you would basically have a file system, which gets some virtual device, which is given to you from a volume manager. Then the volume manager goes and works with all your disks. And this introduces kind of a layer of complexity that actually makes it less effective for the file system to do some interesting things.